الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praise is due to Allah the sole creator sustainer and cherisher of the universe and may his peace and blessings be upon his last prophet and messenger Muhammad and upon all prophets and messengers who preceded him I greet you all, my dear brothers and sisters, with the greeting of all of the prophets, from Adam to Muhammad, peace be upon them all, the greeting of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, which means may the peace, blessing, and mercy of God, Allah, be with you all. And I wish in the very outset to express two things before we get to heavy stuff. First, my great thanks and appreciation for the Ottawa Muslim Association and for all excellencies who graced us with their presence this evening and to you all for your kind invitation to share a few humble thoughts with you. Secondly, I cannot help also by express my feeling in this kind of gathering with people from various national and religious backgrounds coming together as brothers and sisters. And when I was looking around, one particular verse from the Quran immediately came to mind. The verse appears in chapter 49, it's verse 13. And I just beginning with that by way of introducing the topic. Interesting enough, that verse does not begin by addressing Muslims. It does not say, O oh Muslims or O oh believers. It says, Ya Ayyuhannas, O oh mankind. That's a very inclusive address from God to humanity through that last scripture, the Quran. And in fact, it's interesting to notice that in the Quran, while sometimes it addresses Muslims, especially when it comes to their particular religious duties like prayer and fasting, there are more than 200 verses in the Quran that begins with the address, O oh, mankind, all of you, God is addressing everyone. And that's significant. Then it goes on. It says, we means God, that's royal we. We created you from a single male and a female, or male and female, depending how we translate it. Which actually means that you are all one family. And if you have the same set of parents, then there is a human family, diverse as it may be, but one family. Then it goes on. And we made you into nations and tribes. Why? That you may get to know one another and recognize one another. This is in full consistency with another verse in the Quran in chapter 30, verse 22 which explains why people on earth have different languages and complexion. And it says in the translation of meaning, of the signs of God, the signs of his mercy and wisdom, is the creation of heavens and earth and the diversity of your languages and your complexion. That is a sign of the creation of Allah. My favorite analogy is like a bouquet of flower, where the white flower is beautiful in its own right. So is the yellow, the blue, the pink, and more beautiful are all of them together. And then it establishes finally at the end of that verse, the sole criterion on the basis of which a human being can be a better human being. It says, Inna akramakum indallahi atqakum. The most honored of you in the sight of God is the one who is most righteous. Forget about color, language, even faith claims 
because faith claims are to be settled by Allah in the day of judgment. But this is the translation of true faith. I'd like to first make a remark concerning the topic. In order to achieve world peace and mutual understanding, it is not only enough to talk about what is agreeably positive points. I am sure all of you here, in some degree or the other, are already past Islam 101. And initially, even when I thought of the topic dealing with world peace, I had to make some kind of modification even in the last minute as I was thinking and flying in the plane next to me, uh, a brother who lives here in Ottawa, uh, Salim, brother Salim, Jam. And we kept discussing the topic because I was hesitant myself as to whether I should deal also with these broad issues of what does the term Islam come from? How does the concept of peace fused in uh, theological and eschatological terminology in Islam, how the concept of peace is inherent in the objective, the five broad objectives of Islamic law to safeguard faith, life, mind, honor, and wealth, to explain the meaning of jihad and so on and so forth. But then I mentioned to him also that in the last uh, few weeks, I have been following the trend led by some people in the media or other circles who seem to have uh, been promoting antagonism at the time when what we need more is to promote love. We have seen lots of articles, I don't know what is your share here in Ottawa, quoting things from the Qur'an out of context and trying somehow to convince the public that hatred and harassment of Muslims is justified because violence, dominance, and imperialism is inherent in the very scriptures of Islam. I know that might be a delicate topic, and like I said earlier, it might be a heavier stuff than dealing with the more one-on-one -on -one thing that we have heard. But since you've heard that already, I thought it might be beneficial to go a little bit beyond that because world peace and understanding can also be achieved not only positively by presenting the positive things, but by also dispelling misunderstanding and misquotations. To do that, I propose to deal with the following issues first. A brief introduction to the methodology with which we should understand uh, the topic and then move on to classify the most common types of error in understanding and interpreting the Quran, including, by the way, some interpretation by some Muslims. And then move on to um, deal, and that's the heart of the topic, with some of the commonly misquoted, mispresented, or misunderstood verses in the Quran. To start with, in the introduction, as some of you might, have, might be able to see on the PowerPoint, it's um, the need for objectivity and honesty when we deal with a topic like that. To me, that translates into, number one, trying to have some sort of control on the issue of emotions. And I address that not only to non-Muslims, but to Muslims as well. Let's not emotional feeling without evidence blind a person from trying to see the truth as truth. The Quran teaches self-criticism. It teaches fairness and saying the right thing, even if it be against yourself or your close kins. The Quran advocates justice even with the enemy, those who show enmity. You have also to say the word of truth and justice. Secondly, when we deal with the broader issue of relationship between Muslims and non-Muslims, I'm using non-Muslims in a positive sense, those who are outside or not part of the Muslim community of faith, I can't find any better word, but I'm using it in a positive sense. When we deal with this kind of relationship, we have to be honest and realistic also in realizing 
that we're talking about at least 1,400 years of interaction, some of which was surrounded by hostilities, other periods by cooperation, not only with Christians, but with Jews and others in building a civilization such as the House of Wisdom in Baghdad, Islamic universities in Spain that was the jewel of Europe. But there have been periods of conflict. So my second precaution on the issue of objectivity is to try and be aware of the historical legacy that could be cloud the thinking of Muslims or their friends for that matter. We have to keep that also clear in mind. A third and final aspect of methodology is that when we try to understand and or promote better understanding uh, between Islam and other uh, sister religions, it is very essential to make a clear distinction in mind between pure Islam, normative Islam, and the opinions and the way some people interpret certain aspects of it. There is only two, there are only two primary sources of Islam, no third. One is the Quran that Muslims accept as the verbatim word of God dictated to the last Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, through Angel Gabriel. The second is also another form of revelation known as hadith, and some scholars use the term sunnah, but basically it refers to the words, action, and approvals of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in his capacity as a prophet, receiving revelation only in meaning, but expressing that in his own words. So hadith is not the word of God, but it is not the invention of the prophet, it is something that he's directed to tell people, but in his own words. Anything outside of that, and must, you must have heard the term fatwa, which literally means a religious opinion or interpretation, are not infallible. They are not infallible. And there is no religious system or an institution in Islam that says that there is, for example, similar to basic concept about papacy that has the final authority as a person or religious institution to say, this is the only interpretation, this is the only opinion. Which means that any person's opinion, no matter how great scholars in the past or present are saying, has to be tested against the primary sources of Islam. And this is the reference of all. And I do emphasize that because it is quite easy to launch a criticism against any world faith by quoting scholars of that religion. Scholars are not perfect. You get 1,400 years of scholarships. You get people who might have given opinion based on certain circumstances surrounding them. So to quote authorities, even among Muslim scholarship, in order to prove a particular point is not that definitive unless that opinion is tested again against the two sources, primary sources of Islam. Now, coming to the foundation for this presentation, the errors. And I thought perhaps a most logical and easy way to classify the errors in interpreting the Quran. There are many, but just chose the one that are relevant to our topic, especially in Muslim, non-Muslim relation. First, relate to what I call errors of translation. A lot of people quote a translation of the meaning of the Quran and say, the Quran say, no. The Quran was not revealed in English. The Quran was revealed in Arabic. And it is well known that there are always problems translating from one language to the other. Actually, some scholars dispute whether there could be any translation of the Quran. I prefer to use the term interpretive translation of the meaning of the Quran. And oftentimes it reflects the translator's own understanding and images. So don't quote from a translation of the Quran, say the Quran say that it is the translation of the meaning of the Quran. A second problem or category of errors is that when the Quran is translated, it is so profound 
And there must have been good reason why God chose the Arabic language with its richness and diversity of meaning, depending on the context, to reveal his last book, to give these profound meanings and express them. So sometimes even people translate lexically correctly, but in terms of essence and context, it is erroneous translation. So it's not just the lexical meaning in the dictionary. There are a lot more to interpreting and understanding the Quran than going to a dictionary and finding an equivalent word. It could be erroneous, even though it's correct lexically. The third source of problems is what I love to call, the, using the computer language, the cut and paste approach. And I humbly suggest you my motto on that. If you use the cut and paste approach, you can prove anything you want from any scripture you want. Anything under the earth can be proven. And if you don't have a computer, you can buy a pair of scissors for two bucks, cut verses from the middle, cut it out of context, and you can prove anything. Just put it together, the cut and paste approach. And I'll be giving you lots of examples of those cut and paste approach. Well, to put it in a different language, the out-of-context interpretation. And there are four basic categories of out-of-context interpretations. One, out of the context of the verse. Some people even would not care to quote the entire verse. They clip it in the middle. And not, sometimes you, you quote only one part of a verse if there is no change in meaning. But clipping a verse in the middle in such a way that it gives a totally different meaning altogether. You know, there is one verse in the Quran that says, don't pray, don't even come close to prayers. And some of you might say, how could it be? Muslims are required to pray five times a day. But if you continue the rest of the verse, it says, don't come to prayers when you're intoxicated. So clipping could totally even turn the meaning upside down. The second is that sometimes people also would quote even a full verse from the Quran but paying no attention to the verses immediately before or after in the same section that deal with the same subject. In that case, you lose the context where that verse was revealed. The third is that the Quran completes and explains itself. So a person might quote even a whole section, but it's wrong. Why? Because it overlooks the context of the whole Qur'an, so the proper methodology of understanding any topic, is to bring together not only one text, not only one section, but to bring all the verses in the Qur'an and whatever relevant of hadith, authentic hadith, or saying of the Prophet, together. And then you can understand the topic in context rather than going in all kinds of directions. Fourthly, out of context historically, and this is the most serious problem with lots of quotation that many writers use to say violence is rooted in Islam. Check the number of verses and surahs they quote from. You will find that most of them, most of them, come from two surahs in the Quran. Surah number eight and nine. And people who do not care to find out the context of these two surahs historically, come up with erroneous generalization about what Islam teaches. These were revealed in the context of conflict and warfare between the early Muslim community and the pagan Arabs who spared no effort to undermine their religion, committed so many atrocities against them, including murder. And people forget about that historical context and how to deal with people in that state of war and say that's the general relationship that should permeate relationship between uh, Muslims and non-Muslims alike. Let me go through this cut and paste. I put it in a form of myth, common statements that are erroneous. I have classified already the type of errors. I leave it up to your own judgment to find what kind of errors are there. Some would be very obvious. First, how many times you must have seen or read that Muslims are so offensive to those who don't follow their faith, they're calling them infidels? Or people even referring to the text of the Quran in Arabic 
and translate the word kuffar, and I'll come to that term, into infidels. To me, that's a straight error in the first place of translation. The word infidel, if you check the dictionary, is quite negative and offensive. And I wonder whether those people who are using that term are instigating hatred against Islam because they say Islam consider you as an infidel. Just go to any dictionary and sometimes an infidel is described as some who believe in something very weird or strange or one who does not believe in God even in the first place. This is not the translation of the term kafir. Let me give you an evidence right from the Quran to see again another error, contextual error in this kind of translation. Even though this is enough to say translation is wrong is enough. But to confirm it further from the Quran, are we to consider Jews and Christians as people who are infidels in a sense that they don't believe in God? That would fly in the face of verse 46 in the Quran in Surah 29, Ankabut, which says it very clearly that when you dialogue with the people of the book, you dialogue in the best and most courteous way. But then it says, وَقُولُوا آمَنَّا بِالَّذِي أُنزِلَ إِلَيْنَا وَأُنزِلَ إِلَيْكُمْ وَإِلَاهُنَا وَإِلَاهُكُمْ وَاحِدٌ And say to them, mean to Jews and Christians, we believe in what has been revealed to you, means in its original form, and what has been revealed to us. Your Lord and ours is one and the same, and to whom we all submit. Doesn't the Quran tell us that for Jews and Christians, they believe in God, how could they be called infidels? Furthermore, a question that I leave you to research it and find an answer. Do you know who invented the term infidel? Where in the world it was invented? And against whom it was used? You find that Muslims are away from that. It was not Muslims who introduced that term or used it against others. It was used against them. And those who tried to justify the unchristian, I emphasize, there is no blame on Christ or his noble teaching. Those who abused the name, the good name of Christ and conducted the crusades were the ones who referred to Muslims as infidels and to justify arousing the hatred of the masses, they used the term the infidel Muslims. And to the big surprise, when those people came to fight against infidel, they find that they have the purest form of monotheism. But this is how masses sometimes are led by politicians or other institutions. Not all politicians, of course, some, some politicians. All right. Another uh, second example of uh, cut and paste. All non-Muslims are disbelievers. All right. Is that a correct term to start with? Is there a difference between the term unbeliever and disbeliever? In my humble understanding, an unbeliever is someone who may not be aware of something, so he doesn't believe in it. He's never known or heard. So he's unbeliever. He's not exposed to it. Whereas a disbeliever seems to indicate that someone has been exposed to certain truth or information and then he deliberately rejected it. And that's why sometimes the Quran uses the term kafaru, verb, in a very active verb form. Know something but reject it. It is truth but I'm not going to accept it. All right. That distinction then raises another issue. Is it possible that a person who is from an Islamic perspective Unbeliever, an unbeliever will be forgiven by Allah. The answer does not come in an opinion. You go to the Quran in Surah Al Isra, Surah 17, in Ayah 15. وما كنا معذبين حتى نبعث رسولا. Allah says in the Quran, we will not punish until we have sent a messenger. So a person who was not exposed to the message did not know about the message is not to be condemned, and it's not our job to condemn. It is left to God to 
judge that person in accordance with what he knew about the truth and whether he rejected it out of pride or whatever, or he didn't know or didn't fully understand it. That's a misplaced eye. Okay. The third one. Okay. Go back to space. Some non Muslims, some say, all right, admittedly, not all those who did not accept Islam are disbelievers, some are unbelievers, they don't know. But they say, well, but some people have been exposed to the message of Islam. So at least some of them who willingly rejected it and did not accept the final prophet and final scripture as you Muslims understand it, are to be classified as disbelievers according to your own definitions. What do you say about that? But the question here, when you use the term disbeliever, disbeliever in what? Are Jews and Christians disbelievers in God or revelation? The answer was given early in chapter 29 or Surah 29 in the Quran. Do Jews and Christians or reject the basic generic teaching of God that was revealed to all of the prophets? The answer is no. In fact, the Quran says that all prophets were Muslims. And in fact, the ayah that was recited earlier, وَلَا تَمُتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ Don't die except in the state of Islam. Actually, it could also be translated, don't die except in the state of submission to Allah. Because that's what the generic meaning of the term Islam means, to achieve peace with God, within oneself, with the creation of God, whether humans, animals, vegetation, or ecology, through Submission, willing submission to God. We cannot interpret the word Islam always to mean only the community that follows Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. This is the last form of Islam. But generic Islam, as the Quran indicates, has been the teaching and message of all of the prophets. We cannot say that people of the book are disbeliever in that core message of God or the basic moral teaching taught by all of the prophets. What are they disbelievers then? What did they disbelieve or reject? They disbelieve in the finality of the mission of Prophet Muhammad and the Quran as the last revelation of Allah. But could that be regarded really as a derogatory term, really that someone does not disbelieve? Well, every human being believes in something, disbelieves in something based on his own conscience. We are not to hold people accountable here. So even if you say they're disbeliever, all right, theologically, that's fine. But in terms of ultimate consequence for that, it's not up to you or me to mistreat them in this life here. This is the function of God. And let us remember again, those who say yes, but many Jews and Christians know about Islam and read about Islam. But let me ask you this. How about if they read about Islam from books written by people with an agenda? People who wrote actually to blemish the image of Islam. And they thought with all sincerity that this is the correct knowledge of Islam. This is professor so-and-so. This is doctor so-and-so. They didn't realize how erroneous the information is. Who are we to judge whether they really got the true picture and message of Islam and deliberately? But even if they did, it's not our function to hold them accountable for that. But that brings me to another sensitive term that I find many of even my Muslim brothers and sisters use it in a very uh, generalized way, simply because of the lack of understanding of the origin of the term and what really it means. A lot of Muslims might use the term kafir and kuffar. You translate more or less like disbelievers. As if it is really, in a way, a derogatory term. Well, there is a difference between what is right and what is wrong theologically. But again, I keep emphasizing theological correctness or incorrectness is left to God to judge all. But what exactly do we mean when we use the term kufr and kafir? Literally speaking, kufr means to conceal. To commit an act of kufr means to conceal. In a way, you can say that a farmer who is putting the seed and hiding the seed, concealing the seed in the, in the ground, is doing an act of kufr. 
I'm not suggesting that you go to this farmer and say you're kafir because you might get a blow in the nose. I mean, in the literal sense, it could be called he kafir. He's hide, he hides, he conceals the seed in the ground. But then there is an interesting ayah that many Muslims do not really reflect carefully upon. Can a person be a Muslim and committing an act of kufr, not in the greater sense? Well, the answer comes in the Quran. When it speaks in that surah, surah 3, about pilgrimage, it says pilgrimage is mandatory on Muslims who are able to do that. And anybody memorize what does it say after that? وَمَنْ كَفَرَ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَنِيٌ عَنِ الْعَالَمِينَ But those who, if you take it literally, who commit kufr, Allah is self-sufficient. He doesn't need people. Here, kufr does not mean rejection of Islam or the Prophet. Mean being ungrateful. You're concealing your gratefulness to God for whatever he has given you. But of course, in the theological sense, and that's why the Quran used the term kafir to people who deliberately rejected the truth, is that a kafir, in fact, is someone who is concealing or covering up his or her pure innate nature that knows that there is a creator of this universe. And that creator must be one to conceal the innate nature, the spiritual nature that the Quran expresses in breathing the divine breath in every human being. And to go against their pure nature to worship idols or not to follow the true faith of God. But then there's Another aspect, and my brother Salim, when he was traveling, he asked me the same question. He said, I am confused and people keep asking me about that question. Can we really say that shirk, which literally in Arabic means to associate, i.e. to associate others with the one God in his divine, exclusive divine attributes, what is the difference between shirk and kufr and people of the book? I said, brother, the difficulty sometimes arise even in the mind of Muslims because the ter these terms are used in a variety of meaning, layers of meaning depending on the specific context. I said if you mean by shirk, people who really worship gods beside God, then that description does not apply to the people of the book. And the evidence is found directly in Surah 98. Lam Kafaru min ahli al-kitabi wal mushrikeen. So it speaks about those who rejected even Islam in the ultimate sense, knowingly rejected Islam. But then it divides them into two groups. Those who associate others with Allah, like pagan Arab, like those who believe in more than one God as one category. But then the same ayah speaks about people of the book. People of the book, and they are quite distinct in, in that respect. And that's why in Islamic law, as you know, there are special affinity with them for both or all three Abrahamic religion, as normally they are referred to, believe in the one and same God. They could differ theologically. How to understand God is the Islamic monotheistic formulation, a correct one or the Trinitarian formulation or anything in between. They differ. But I have yet to see a Christian or Jew who say, I believe in more than one God, the same as upheld by a Muslim. They both believe in revelation of Allah, as Surah Al-Ankabut indicated, in moral teaching, in responsibility, in life hereafter. So there is some distinction also that is made there. But suppose even they deliberately rejected the Quran and said, let be no compulsion in religion. Another cut and paste. And this is one of the most curious ones. Somebody writes and says the Quran uses derogatory terms against non-Muslims. And it says non-believers are unclean. They refer to again to the same two surahs, actually to surah 9, which deal with the state of war between Muslims and pagan Arabs. Again, you find a number of errors here. A number of errors. They take one part of one verse Number one, if you continue the verse, it says they are not allowed to come to the sacred house after this year. 
Oh, sacred house, so there must be historical context. What is the historical context? Is that the pagan Arabs desecrated the Kaaba, the house of Abraham, the house of monotheism, by placing the idols in and around it. And as such, it would not be possible after Muslims, Islam became the predominant religion in Arabia, or at least in Hejaz at the time, that people who worship Allah come to circumambulate around the Kaaba, and the pagan Arabs also bring the idols. It doesn't make any sense. Kaaba has to be restored to its pure monotheistic nature. But there is another form of uncleanliness, but not physical, that many of those pagan Arabs used to go around the Kaaba totally naked, which is indecent. So when the Quran used that term then, it uses in the context of, we might say, not really physical uncleanliness that you have to wash yourself if somebody touch you. It talk about this. But more importantly is the mistranslation of the Quran. Because the ayah says, al-mushrikun, mushriks. And we have seen before the Quran made distinction between mushrik, like pagan Arabs who worship idols and multiple gods, versus people of the book. So the ayah does not have anything to do with Jews and Christians, it is related to that historical context and this particular situation in Arabia. Okay. Now, cut and paste number six. Probably heard that. I think it should be nine, five. Kill the unbelievers wherever you find them. Ambush them and wait for them in every corner. Probably heard that, right? The Quran teaches aggressiveness, and this is known as the, the verse of the sword, and it tells Muslims, go and kill un the unbeliever, kill the unbelievers wherever you find them. Of course, if you take it in that sense, from that one half verse, then every Muslim would be obligated to carry either a gun or sword or machine gun or whatever. Just go out, any non-Muslim you find, just the Quran tell you, God tell you that you're doing that in the name of God. You know something, when I was studying in the early 60s, mid 60s in, at Indiana University, at the time there was a big debate in the United States about prayers in the school. And the chief justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, Justice Douglas, I think his name at the time, you know, he made a statement. And he said, if we allow every person to do prayers in the school, in the beginning of the school, then the Muslims, misspelled of course, meaning Muslims, then the Muslims would recite the first verse in the Quran, the first chapter in the Quran that tells him to go and kill the unbeliever wherever he finds them. I think he got his number wrong as well as his understanding also wrong. Now, what does the verse really speak about? And what is the context? That's what we need to look at it. First of all, what is the historical context? Again, that appeared in the same surah, nine, one of these two surahs about that conflict with pagan Arabs. If you read even the remaining part of the verse, okay, it says, فاقتلوا المشركين حيث وجدتموهم وخذوهم واحصروهم واقعدوا لهم كل مرس فإن تابوا وأقاموا الصلاة وآتوا الزكاة فخلوا سبيلهم that if they desist from the wrong especially of course if they are guided and they stop their hostilities guided Islam it says leave them alone so if the command really was to kill them because they are unbelievers then there should be no chance given to them because if they stop then leave them Leave them alone. But that's not all. Historically, about whom does this apply? About Jews, Christians, and everybody who's not a Muslim? Or does it deal specifically in historical context with the pagan Arabs who tortured Muslims? And as you know, Muslims were tortured to death, like the father of Ammar ibn Yasser, like Sumayya, the mother of Ammar. Muslims were tortured even to death. They were exiled from Mecca. They were fought against in wave after wave. And whenever there were treaties with them, like the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, they were the ones who broke the treaty and killed the allies of Muslims. 
So when you get into the battlefield for people who betrayed and killed and tortured, and the Quran says, kill them wherever you find them, does it mean kill every other person or kill the aggressors who are carrying arms against you in the battlefield? Not only the rest of the verse, but I urge you, go, there is nothing hidden. Go and get any translation, even of the meaning of the Quran. And put it not in the context of one verse, the context of the section, as I said earlier. And the relevant section here is the verses before and after from the beginning of the surah. I do not wish to spend too much time on that because you can take lots of analysis in that. But basically, that context speak about people who started aggressive or hostilities against you. They are the ones who started aggression and persecution against you in the first place. Even in the middle of these very strong verses about the warfare, in the middle of that, it speaks about non-Muslims who did not betray their treaty with Muslims and say for these people, complete their term for them. The same section speak about those who betrayed their treaty and it says if they have power over you, if they prevail over you, they will never even consider any bonds, family, familial bonds when they persecute or kill you. Just read it, you find lots of indication that it is quite specific and not even generalized. Even in the middle of all these verses, one of the most noble things in the Quran it says if one of the unbelievers, mean those, who, not anyone, the one who's fighting, min al-mushrikeen, the Arab pagans, istajaraka fa'ajir, seek your protection, even in the battlefield. And he says, all right, I seek your protection. You should give him protection. You know why? The Quran says, so that he may have an opportunity to, to listen to the word of Allah. So if the purpose is to cut as many heads as possible, kill and destroy, then there's no need because he's still unbeliever. But even the slightest sign of peacefulness, of readiness to communicate, it says you should take him to a safe place. You never take advantage of that. What could be more noble, even in verses dealing with war? One following thing that I'd like to add here also is that if indeed that logic has any foundation whatsoever in the totality of the Quranic context, not just the verse or section, then it doesn't have any meaning at all because it runs squarely against various places in the Quran, including that famous one, let be no compulsion in religion. You don't kill someone because of not accepting Islam. That's why Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, the great scholar of Islam, he discussed that issue. Is the fight against those unbelievers because of their lack of faith or refusal to accept Islam or or because of their aggression. And he concluded that it is because of aggression. Ibn Taymiyyah did not come up with that from his own mind. And inshallah, I'll show you as we go on a specific indication in the Quran that the purpose or the reason for fighting is not their disbelief in Islam, but because of their aggression. There is one more point before moving to the next one. Some people say, yeah, yeah, but, uh, but that, uh, those verses in the Quran that speak about courteous dialogue and cordial relationship with non-Muslims has all been abrogated by what they call the verse of the sword, by that verse in chapter 9. There is no evidence from the Quran that this has been abrogating other verses. And while some scholars, and that's why I said earlier, don't quote me as scholars, scholars could be wrong also. More discerning scholars rejected this idea that some writers in the past said that this verse precluded all the other verses. It is totally erroneous and there is no evidence. And it is well known in the methodology of Usur, that's not the methodology of Islamic law, that something that is definitive cannot be rejected on the basis of something which is probabilistic. The Quran is clear, muhkam. The verses in the Quran that speak about good treatment of non-Muslims in spite of the rejection of Islam are numerous and clear-cut. For someone to make a claim that one verse uh, abrogated all of that, that's an opinion, and an opinion cannot supersede the clear text of the Quran. You follow? 
cannot by a mere claim like this. And the proper understanding, as many discerning scholars have found out, that there is not, no abrogation here. The verse about the sword is applicable in a situation when people are trying to finish you off, to destroy you. Yes, you can fight them. And the verses about inviting people, as the Quran says, in wisdom and beautiful exhortation, applies, applied in the past, and apply today, and will apply tomorrow for anyone who is peacefully communicating with Muslims, without compulsion. So each verse has its own scope of application, not that one abrogated or replaced the other. This is a myth, common as it may be. It's a myth. Seven, Muslims are required to fight all non-Muslims until they accept Islam. And again, to familiarize you, those who know Arabic, they refer to two ayahs in the Quran that you use the term fight them until there is no more fitna or I'll come to that word or persecution and religion belong to Allah and another ayah in surah 8 Al-Anfal which uses the term even stronger and all religion belongs to Allah and you know how some people interpret that to mean that religion belongs to Allah that means Islam becomes the only religion dominates over all. Is that interpretation correct? Let's go back to the words used in this verse. وَقَاتِلُوهُمْ حَتَّى لَا تَكُونَ فتنة. That appeared in Surah 2 in verse 193. The word fitna here means religious persecution. That means fight those aggressive people until there is no more religious persecution. And historically we know it. They used to punish people even who remained back in Mecca if they discovered that they accepted Islam and harassed them. So yakun ad lillah does not mean Islam is imposed on everyone else, but it means that people have the freedom, the religion belong to God, not to the rules and dictates of rulers, and people can choose a religion, whether it's Islam or otherwise. But there is even another aspect to keep the consistency of the methodology we mentioned earlier. What is the context of the Qur'an? The context is freedom to choose a religion, no compulsion in religion. How come the Qur'an says no compulsion and then says fight them until there's only Islam? What, what sense does that make? All right. Moving on. Continuing this uh, seven, seventh issue. Sometimes it gets too slow, and then when I press it, it... Okay, the remainders of the, of the verse, like I say, حتى لا تكون فتنة, that there's no more uh, pressure or persecution. So actually, the section really deals with unprovoked aggression, which I promise to come back to. You know that verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, it's a very important one. Chapter 2, verse 191. وَقَاتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ الَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُونَكُمْ وَلَا تَعْتَدُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمَعْتَدِينَ Fight in the way of God. Some people quote only here and stop. لا تقرب الصلاة. Fight in the way of God, if you continue. Those who fight again, and believe me, I have seen literature sent to me and questions. How come your Quran says fight in the way of God? The Quran teaches aggression and fight. I said, brother, complete the verse. Fight in the way of God. Those who fight against you, but commit no aggression or transgression. Allah doesn't love those who transgress. Eight. But they say, but the Quran say that you fight even the people of the book until they pay the poll tax, jizya, while they are subdued. And some even people say humiliated. You get a number of errors here. First. What is the historical context? Does it say that Muslims are obligated to fight all people of the book in the world until they come under the rule of Islam and they pay the poll tax and be humiliated or subdued? The historical context is well known and that's totally ignored by people who write about these issues. The historical context is that Islam was in great danger and the Muslim community, the budding, the nascent community, was in great danger, both from within, 
the hypocrites, as well as elements that were hostile to Muslims, even in the Arabian Peninsula. Some of the tribes in Medina that betrayed Muslims and cooperated with the enemies at the time of war, which we call today high treason, and harassed Muslims and undermined their religion by all means they can. The tribes in the northern part of Arabia, because of their proximity to Byzantine Empire, some of them were accepted Christianity, especially the Ghassanites or Ghassasna. And these people showed a great deal of aggressiveness and antagonism towards Muslims to the point that they committed an act that is regarded today as an act of war. They killed the messenger sent by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to peacefully invite them to Islam. So when the ayah and the surah is dealing, in, and again it's surah 9, in that context of enmity, the Byzantines who gathered a huge army in Tabuk, which is now in the northern part of Saudi Arabia, to way, way, you know, whip or to remove Islam totally from existence. This is the circumstances where the necessity to defend that community from those great danger would be to fight to subdue them to stop the possibility of attack against the Muslim community. But then there is a big misconception about the question of jizya. Some people think that jizya is punishment for a person who did not accept Islam, the pearl tax, or at best a bribe that when you become a Muslim you will not pay the jizya. They are mistaken on both grounds. In fact, if a Muslim, if a non-Muslim under the rule of Islam accepts Islam, he will have greater financial obligations because he would be required to pay zakah, he would be required to pay zakat al-fitr, uh, according to the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, he would be required to pay additional sadaqah even if needed, or taxes, and voluntary sadaqah. So that you're not escaping, you would be, be paying more even. And then some people mistranslate the Qur'an also. An yadin. They think an yadin means humiliated. On the contrary, as Imam Shafi explained, an yadin means ability. In the Arabic language, yad, like they say, al yadul uliya khayur min al yad actually is a symbol of ability that means as Muslim scholars interpreted, that you cannot impose jizya on a woman, a child, an old man, a person who's poor. It mu he must be able to pay that poll tax. But what is the purpose of poll tax then? In Islamic law, all citizens, Muslims and non-Muslims alike, are entitled to state services, to social security, and they're not obligated to serve in the Muslim army, obligated, because it might contradict their feeling because there is a religious connotation. So there is defense benefit also involved in that. Some people might say, why isn't the secular system better? Why did, didn't Muslims in the past say to non-Muslims, you pay zakah equally with your Muslim brothers and sisters? But they miss one point. People think of zakah only as tax in the secular sense. Whereas for the Muslim and for those who know about Islam living with Muslims among non-Muslims, that the uh, zakah is not just a tax, it has a religious connotation, and you must have heard about the pillars of Islam, one of which is charity. Actually, it is more respect of the religious sensitivities to say don't pay zakah, which is religious, pay the equivalent, pay jizya. And by the way, some scholars like Dr. Abdul Karim Zaidan, in an excellent book about the rights of non-Muslims under Islamic State, he made it clear that this is, uh, this is not a religious duty on Muslim to have jizya. If, in the judgment of an Islamic government, they want to apply another system, it is not really a must. And then finally, the biggest misunderstanding, وَهُمْ صَاغِرُونَ They don't understand that the word صَاغِرُونَ actually in Arabic could, yes, mean humiliated, but has another important meaning referred to by Imam Shafi, rahimahullah, one of the great scholars of Islam. صَاغِرُونَ here means accepting the authority of the Islamic State. But let me ask you that question. When you make your tax return before April 1st, and when you pay tax to the Canadian government, you have the same sagar. You're admitting the authority of Canadian government to impose tax on you, don't you? The same thing, sagirun, that means accepting the legitimacy of the Islamic government under whose protection they are living. Okay, very quickly, a couple of more. Fight constantly against your neighbors. And let them find firmness in you. I don't want to repeat much. 
historical context appear in the same surah, surah number nine, about those who represented threats to the Muslim community. And there is another historical evidence. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, even when he moved to Medina, migrated to Medina, had a powerful following who were willing to sacrifice. Whenever he marched towards any neighboring tribes to make sure that they would not conspire with his arch enemies, the Meccans, and whenever they offered to live in peace with Muslims and not to help in any fight or attack against Medina, he accepted that from them and he led them. This is known in Islamic history as al muadaa Wa'da'ahum. al muadaa that all right, we live in peace, fine. No blame on you. All right. And then I'd like to add one final comment. If any of these quotations in the Quran were to be interpreted as Muslims being obligated to fight against all those who do not accept Islam, that means that 20% of the world Muslim population must be in constant fighting and bloodshed with the whole the rest of the world, which is totally not the message of Islam. That's why Sheikh Muhammad Ghazali Rahimallah, said it's, it's an idiocy. It's an idiocy to interpret that Muslims have to be in constant fighting of others. And by the way, let me add one comment before moving to one of the last two. That some people say, but doesn't the Quran say that Allah sent his messenger? That Allah is the one who sent his messenger, means Muhammad, peace be upon him, with the guidance and the religion of truth so that it may prevail over all ways of life or religion. And they say, isn't that a, a green light for Muslims to be dominant? Probably you read that in the paper somewhere. The answer here is that they don't understand what mean yudhir. What does it mean yudhirahu? I think that was coming actually in 11. Is it yudhirahu in a sense of political, that Muslims have the sole political power in the world, hegemony? Yudhirahu in terms of military power and subjugation? Or is there another more profound meaning of prevailing that is consistent with the totality of the message of the Quran that means the truth of Islam would be manifest and known. Yudhirahu, to reveal the truth of Islam that was given to the Prophet. One final one, because I, I jumped one actually, that was coming in 11, that just gets a, little, a bit spontaneous. But this is basically the last one. You must have heard that. How many times you heard that the Quran teaches hostility especially towards Jews and Christians, regardless of aggression. Because the Quran says, they say, don't take Jews and Christians for friends. Just by show of hands. How many of you heard that sometimes? By show of hands, don't feel shy. That's quite common, is it? Okay, let's see what problems are there in that myth. The original Arabic term in the Quran, and again, the Quran is not in English. No, the Quran was not revealed in English. It did not say for those who know Arabic, لا تتخذوا اليهود والنصارى أصدقاء, but أولياء. And in the Arabic language, there is a difference between أصدقاء means friends, and أولياء, which means protectors. People that you have to alliance with them to protect you. Does that offend a Jew or Christian when you simply say that Muslims should look for their own security and protection to each other as people who share the same faith? It shouldn't be offensive to anyone. People of various religions also, or other ideologies even, seek mutual protection. But it doesn't mean be hostile and don't have friendship. But then there is more than that. If you look at the sections, again following the same order of types of mistakes, if you look at the very same section, you find that it deals with the hypocrites who, when Islam was still trying to stand on its own feet, in the midst of danger. They go and make alliance with the pagan Arabs in Mecca, but they remain part of the Muslim community. And as the Quran says, they say, all right, if Muslims win, we say, oh, we're part of your community. And if the unbelievers win in the world, they say, look, you know, we were your friends, we're supplying you with all kinds of encouragement. So the Quran condemns that kind of hypocrisy. And it is in that context that they don't take Jews and Christians as awliya or others for that matter. If you look further in the same surah, you find that it speaks also about people who ridiculed Muslims. 
say don't take them awliya because they ridicule you and when you stand for prayer they mock at you when you stand لا تتخذوا الذين اتخذوا دينكم هزوا ولعبا don't take those who took your religion for mockery as awliya so talk about state of hostility as well but then there's something even very interesting if you go to the context of the Quran the broader context of the Quran how come it can be interpreted to say, don't take them as friends whereas this crucial citation in the Quran remember it surah number 60 verses 8 and 9 you know what it says Allah does not forbid you or restrain you O Muslims with respect to those who did not fight you because of your religion to undermine your Islam or drive you out of your homes oppressing you that you should deal with them in kindness and justice for God loves those who do good what does it say basically in a few words if any non-Muslims living with you and by the way it doesn't apply only to Jews and Christians all if any non-Muslim is living with you as a neighbor not fighting you because of your Islam that means peaceful with you not oppressing you he's entitled he and she is entitled to that kind treatment but there is something more surprising that translations of the Quran could not convey the original words about the relationship with these peaceful neighbors and friends and colleagues is the Arabic term tabarruhum come from birr spells like b-i-r-r -R. and you know what is the term birr how is defined in Arabic a'la darajat husn al-khuluq the highest degree of good character in dealing with people when the Prophet ﷺ used that term, bir, you know, he used it in the relationship between the person and who? Guess? Parents, exactly. Mother and father. What is the relationship between the person and his parents? It is more than translation of justice, more than kindness. There is respect. There is even an element of love, especially love of good for humanity. How could this be reconciled if we neglect that totality of the context of the Quran. But then there is something very interesting. The verse that I cited earlier from Surah 29 about the etiquette of dialogue with the people of the book. It says, courteous way. How do you be courteous if you're hateful to the person and he's not your friend? But something even more illogical in this cut and paste job. In Islam, if you take the idea that Islam says, chop the head of someone who's not a Muslim. The same Islam teaches also that a Muslim male, there are certain forms of interfaith marriage. So a Muslim man, for example, will be allowed to marry a Christian wife. How should he treat his wife? Surah 30, Ayah 21 in the Quran describes marital relationship between husband and wife as one that is based on peace, love and compassion peace love and compassion so if we take that cut and paste meaning of the verse chop the heads of non-muslims the muslim then would go to his wife who's not a muslim and he says honey my book teaches me to live in peace with you i love you i have to be kind to you but the other verse says i have to chop off your head Okay, I discussed this issue of meaning So let me come to some very quick conclusion. You might say that the whole presentation was based largely on quotation that come, like I said, from the two surahs that deal with the hostilities against Muslims, not generalization. But what is more important here, that there is a basic sensible rule. It's not only a rule of Islamic exegesis. It is a sensible rule for anyone. You open the Bible and study it, for example, or any scripture for that matter. You find out what are the predominant themes where you get dozens and dozens and dozens of verses. But then when you get to something that does not seem to go with that, now which one should be understood in the light of which? Do we understand the entirety of the Quran and its message in the light of these few quotations i know admittedly i spent so much time on this few quotations 
and say that the Quran is aggressive, teaches violence, teaches lack of consideration for the rights of others. What is the broad picture? The broad picture where you find hundreds, not dozens, of verses in the Quran are very clear. That the message of the Quran is a message of peace. And I did make that in the introductory point. Secondly, that the basic assumption in the Quran when it deals with relationship between Muslims and others is the acceptance of plurality in society. In the Quran, chapter 10, 11, and 4, I believe also, Surah Nisa, you find numerous references that are made there that says something like this. If God wanted, he would have made all people believers. In another it says, وَلَوْ شَاءَ رَبُّكَ لَجَعَلَ النَّاسَ أُمَّةً وَاحِدًا If Allah wanted, he would have made all people one nation. No, no dispute. Everybody is the same. Everybody believes in the same thing. But then some ayat says, وَلَكِنْ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ فِي مَا آتَاكُمْ فَاسْتَبِقُوا الْخَيْرَاتِ But Allah is testing you in what he has given you. So race with one another in goodness. Theological correctness or incorrectness, it's not your job. Communicate, care, discuss, courteously as the Quran say, live in peace, but leave the theology to be settled. You carry arms only to respond to hostilities and destructive attitudes. Then there's that special place of Jews and Christians that was referred to earlier. And finally, the emphasis after all is profound and profuse in the Quran about human brotherhood. And again, I end with the same verse we started with, O oh mankind, we created you from a single pair of a male and female, made you into nations and tribes to make that you may get to know and recognize one another. The best of you, the most honored of you in the sight of God is one who is most righteous. Let us all compete in this righteousness. Let us communicate with love, with compassion, with understanding, with all other religious communities and invite all to also coexist in peace and mutual respect with Muslims. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praise is due to Allah the sole creator sustainer and cherisher of the universe and may his peace and blessings be upon his last prophet and messenger Muhammad and upon all prophets and messengers who preceded him I greet you all, my dear brothers and sisters, with the greeting of all of the prophets, from Adam to Muhammad, peace be upon them all, the greeting of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, which means may the peace, blessing, and mercy of God, Allah, be with you all. And I wish in the very outset to express two things before we get to heavy stuff. First, my great thanks and appreciation for the Ottawa Muslim Association and for all excellencies who graced us with their presence this evening and to you all for your kind invitation to share a few humble thoughts with you. Secondly, I cannot help also by express my feeling in this kind of gathering with people from various national and religious backgrounds coming together as brothers and sisters. And when I was looking around, one particular verse from the Quran immediately came to mind. The verse appears in chapter 49 and saying the right thing, even if it be against yourself or your close kins, the Quran advocates justice even with the enemy, those who show enmity 
you have also to say the word of truth and justice. Secondly, when we deal with the broader issue of relationship between Muslims and non-Muslims, I'm using non-Muslim in a positive sense, those who are outside or not part of the Muslim community of faith, I can't find any better word, but I'm using it in a positive sense. When we deal with this kind of relationship, we have to be honest and realistic also in realizing that we're talking about at least 1400 years of interaction, some of which was surrounded by hostilities, other periods by cooperation, not only with Christians, but with Jews and others in building a civilization such as the House of Wisdom in Baghdad, Islamic universities in Spain that was the jewel of Europe. But there have been periods of conflict. So my second precaution on the issue of objectivity is to try and be aware of the historical legacy that could be cloud the thinking of Muslims or their friends for that matter. We have to keep that also clear in mind. A third and final aspect of methodology is that when we try to understand and, or promote better understanding uh, between Islam and other uh, sister religions, it is very essential to make a clear distinction in mind between pure Islam, normative Islam, and the opinions and the way some people interpret certain aspects of it. There is only Two, there are only two primary sources of Islam, no third. One is the Quran that Muslims accept as the verbatim word of God dictated to the last Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, through Angel Gabriel. The second is also another form of revelation known as Hadith, and some scholars use the term Sunnah, but basically it refers to the words, more beautiful are all of them together. And then it establishes finally, at the end of that verse, the sole criterion on the basis of which a human being can be a better human being. It says, Inna akramakum atqakum, The most honored of you in the sight of God is the one who is most righteous. Forget about color, language, even faith claims because faith claims are to be settled by Allah in the Day of Judgment. But this is the translation of true faith. I'd like to first make a remark concerning the topic. In order to achieve world peace and mutual understanding, it is not only enough to talk about what is agreeably positive points. I am sure all of you here, in some degree or the other, are already past Islam 101. And initially, even when I thought of the topic dealing with world peace, I had to make some kind of modification even in the last minute as I was thinking and flying in the plane next to me, uh, a brother who lives here in Ottawa, uh, Salim, brother Salim Jam, and we kept discussing the topic because I was hesitant myself as to whether I should deal also with these broad issues of what does the term Islam come from? How does the concept of peace fused in uh, theological and eschatological terminology in Islam? How the concept of peace is inherent in the objective, the five broad objectives of Islamic law to safeguard faith life, mind, honor, and wealth to explain the meaning of jihad and so on and so forth. But then I mentioned to him also that in the last uh, few weeks, I have been following the trend led by some people in the media or other circles who seem to have, it's verse 13, and I just beginning with that by way of introducing the topic. Interesting enough, that verse does not begin by addressing Muslims. It does not say, O oh Muslims, 
or O believers. It says, Ya ayyuhan nas, O mankind. That's a very inclusive address from God to humanity through that last scripture, the Quran. And in fact, it's interesting to notice that in the Quran, while sometimes it addresses Muslims, especially when it comes to their particular religious duties like prayer and fasting, there are more than 200 verses in the Quran that begins with the address, O oh, mankind, all of you, God is addressing everyone. And that's significant. Then it goes on. It says, we means God, that's royal we. We created you from a single male and a female, or male and female, depending how we translate it, which actually means that you are all one family. And if you have the same set of parents, then there is a human family, diverse as it may be, but one family. Then it goes on. And we made you into nations and tribes. Why? That you may get to know one another and recognize one another. This is in full consistency with another verse in the Quran in chapter 30, verse 22 which explains why people on earth have different languages and complexion. And it says in the translation of meaning, of the signs of God, the signs of his mercy and wisdom, is the creation of heavens and earth and the diversity of your languages and your complexion. That is a sign of the creation of Allah. My favorite analogy, is like a bouquet of flower, where the white flower is beautiful in its own right. So is the yellow, the blue, the pink, and uh, being promoting antagonism at the time when what we need more is to promote love. We have seen lots of articles, I don't know what is your share here in Ottawa, quoting things from the Qur'an out of context and trying somehow to convince the public that hatred and harassment of Muslims is justified because violence, dominance, and imperialism is inherent in the very scriptures of Islam. I know that might be a delicate topic and like I said earlier, it might be a heavier stuff than dealing with the more one-on-one thing that we have heard. But since you've heard that already, I thought it might be beneficial to go a little bit beyond that because world peace and understanding can also be achieved not only positively by presenting the positive things, but by also dispelling misunderstanding and misquotations. To do that, I propose to deal with the following issues first. A brief introduction to the methodology with which we should understand uh, the topic and then move on to classify the most common types of error in understanding and interpreting the Quran, including, by the way, some interpretation by some Muslims. And then move on to um, deal, and that's the heart of the topic, with some of the commonly misquoted, mispresented, or misunderstood verses in the Quran. To start with, in the introduction, as some of you might, have, might be able to see on the PowerPoint, it's um, the need for objectivity and honesty when we deal with a topic like that. To me, that translates into, number one, trying to have some sort of control on the issue of emotions. And I address that not only to non-Muslims, but to Muslims as well. Let's not emotional feeling without evidence blind a person from trying to see the truth as truth. The Quran teaches self-criticism. It teaches fear.